Right. My girlfriend is a musician. Oh, so nice. I her like nice shit. Yeah, pro setup. Uh, don't know what kind know. of music is she into? Uh, she does, I don't know, like indie pop. Okay. What instruments? Or is she like producing it or? She's kind of doing everything. Uh, she is mostly vocals and then she plays like some, you know, she has a little keyboard and she does guitar, but mostly it's like uh, electronic, a little bit of like producing by herself and then singing vocals. Yeah. Dick, let's give it a plug. How do people find her stuff? Is yeah. She, uh, yeah. Uh, on SoundCloud? She's on Spotify. Spotify? What's the, does she go by her name or artist name or group or? She just has her name. Yeah. Sarah Bonneville. Sarah Bonneville. Check it out, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. This is a great start to the podcast. We're kind of just rolling into it. Why not? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Well, let's go. What are you up to today? Uh, not much. You know, uh, it's like winter here. It feels like in, in Minneapolis, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's like right around freezing. There's some snow on the ground, some ice. Uh, so, but Hey, it's all right. I grew up in this and, uh, you know, it takes the right attitude. Um, and I definitely don't like being here for like, you know, six, eight months of, of this yeah. weather, but uh, a little bit of it is, is pretty nice and kind of, uh, nostalgic. Um, so actually this morning I, um, I've been doing deliveries. So I work on my bike, um, downtown. I do like food delivery. Uh, so I did lunch rush. <laughs> do you deliver like uber eats or for a particular restaurant uh just apps yeah a couple okay. of different uber and some others i saw the first snow pictures from cyclists today from so i grew up in upstate new york in rochester new york by the great lakes and i used to sell medical devices and in february to march they sent us to the only place colder minneapolis and i was like wow okay we're gonna spend a month and it was for me it was frigid we had people from california dying i mean it was negatives for a week at a time and people were like what is wait a minute very very shocking for those that don't understand that type of cold yeah man yeah like Okay, like 30 degrees, 20 degrees, like, sure, that's cold. I can take that. Yeah. You know, when it's Fahrenheit, when it's below zero in Fahrenheit, I mean, that is real cold. So what are you doing for training? So you indoors a lot? Are you just burying it and riding? Do you ride a mountain bike or what do you, what's your go-to? So are you going to stay, this is a great question, actually, because this applies to a lot of people that are going to listen to this. Do you, because I know you went to Thailand one time, you were in, uh, God, I was looking at someone on Instagram. You were somewhere else, Jamaica. Um, are you so are you staying there for the six months? Or as you said, you're trying you're gonna get out somewhere else this year. What's your plan? Yeah, we usually uh me and my girlfriend, we usually like snowbird. So we try to get out of here um usually after the holidays. Um so it in the in the years past, I've kind of done it differently every year. Okay. I'm doing with my racing. And uh yeah, so this year we're planning on getting out of here right after new year's and going down to austin austin texas cool it's good kind of like down there. Uh, yeah i love i love austin it's kind of like a minneapolis south um i mean it's straight up like minneapolis is on 35 interstate and then austin is on 35 but like you know 1300 miles south <laughs> of that's amazing. And people are riding all year outside. And so you don't, so will you go indoors at all for November, December, or are you just going to grit your teeth? Uh, well, things are a little weird right now with my training. So, uh, I'll just kind of talk about that a little bit. So in August, I started to have some heart, weird heart glitches and I just had some palpitations. Um, so I'm actually not training right now. Uh, I haven't raced since like August, early August. Um, mm. So there's definitely a lot of uncertainty there. Um, I've been going to the doctors. Everything's checking out fine. And, you know, I did all the EKGs, all the, the echo, stress echo. I wore like a little monitor for a little few days and mm. rode with it, trained with it. Um, and they said everything's like fine. I'm like super healthy. Hmm. I don't, I haven't been feeling super awesome. And I mean, obviously there was a reason why I went to the doctor and right. got it checked out. Um, so I'm still being careful. Uh, 
and it could be just overtraining or something like that. Um, so I'm still gonna go to a couple of different doctors, see if they can figure it out. But yeah. damn, dude, I'm sorry to hear that. That's uh, oh, that man, it's yeah, that's a tough one. It's like you want to almost probably go and buy hear something good or bad like the kind of the non-decision is like what where do i go from here yeah it was really hard i mean this is our this like weird limbo has our has already i've already been in this limbo for like a few months Mm -hmm. um so it's actually a lot easier now like i've kind of you know i'm at peace with it uh but Mm -hmm. at first it was really you know i mean i was super focused on training and racing and you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm not really training at all or have anything on the schedule. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was, that was really tough. And it it opened up a lot of, you know, a lot of emotions, but also a lot of thoughts about like what it is to be an athlete and like identity, like things like that. hundred percent. What kind of emotions you feeling from that? I mean, a lot of FOMO, you know, it's just, I, I feel like for, for better or for worse, like athlete, professional athletes, full time athletes, uh, like we're kind of we're just so focused on what we're doing, and we can be kind of uh, obsessive, right? Mm-hmm. Like, an, like the quality that makes us great athletes mm-hmm. is also the quality that that like can definitely cause some like mental strain. Um, and I think it's like this, this devotion, this obsessiveness with what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I was just like, re- kind of lost in my identity for a little bit. Like, you know, what do I do next? Like, am I done? Am I not done? Am I retiring? Like, um, and I wasn't, I'm, I'm not like ready to retire, but I think now with, after some time with, you know, thinking about it and just, uh, you know, just seeing like what, what else there is to life other than racing and kind of being at peace with that. Um, yeah, I, I feel great. I feel fine. Even if I have to stop racing, Mm -hmm. Um, there's just so many cool things in my life uh, other than racing that I can pursue. Um, so yeah, but at first you're right. Like at first it was super hard. What do you think? What's, what are the next big passions when you say tomorrow, like you can't even touch a bike, you can't even ride, not even easy. What do you kind of, what's the natural thing that's going to fill your time? I mean, that's pretty tough, but, um, I I'd like to go back to school, um, uh, mm. back to school for engineering. Um, but I know, I also know like I can't really sit at a desk, you know? Yeah. I have, you know, I've been living this lifestyle for like a decade of just being a race bum. Uh, in other words, a professional athlete. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I I think, I think the trades would be uh, very well suited for me. Um, my girlfriend is a realtor and we are talking about investing in properties here in Minneapolis. Uh, so that, that would be kind of a no brainer, just like learning Mm -hmm. how to work on houses and building Mm -hmm. up, you know, being a, being a, uh, homeowner and landlord, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of connecting to that. I mean, what about something else cycling related though? Like it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be a racer to be in cycling. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, you know, there's so many options and so many avenues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love like one thing that I loved about racing gravel are the expos um mm, mm. so i think you know being in the expos uh and i've already I already have like a connection with um i can't really talk about it too much but um you know some kind of like a sales or expo position definitely in the yeah. bike there's if you ever need i have some friends that are like that's what they do if you ever want to pick their brains about like what do they love or hate about that or how they like some side gig it a really more one guy, but yeah, if you ever want to just chat with him and like get some more like information on that, I'd be happy to connect you guys. Cause I think, yeah, it's, you know, people might not know that 
people might know you from gravel, but you were boss on the road for a while. And so it's like, you've been doing, <laughs> you laugh, but it's like, you've been doing this for a while. And I kind of forgot about that. I was talking to my friend Landry and he's like, well, I was like, yeah, you know, you know, the gravel guy's like, yeah, well, dude, he was on Elevate. And I'm like, oh, wait, was he? You had short hair there though. And that was 2016, maybe. This is a good, let's let's recap you as an endurance athlete for those who are like, wait a minute, this guy's a, a roadie, dare we say, also? <laughs> um, yeah. You started riding when you were like 19, I think I read somewhere. What Were yeah. you doing any endurance sports before that? And you're in Minneapolis at this point in time? That's right, yeah. So I started racing when I was 19, like right out of high school. I was not into sports at all. I was like, a, you know, anti-jock. Uh, I went to like an arts high school and I was a punk, you know, I like wore like a studded vest and yes, dude. I was uh, like, I would go to like basement shows in Minneapolis and listen to punk music. And I was uh, just part of a kind of like this punk hippie thing that was going on here. Um, and biking, cycling was part of it. It was like an anti-car. I mean, okay, 2008, 2009. I mean, maybe you remember that era. It was like, you know anti-oil anti-car like burn all the hummers uh that was kind of the era and i was definitely a part of that <laughs> so is this on a fixed gear bike or this is not on a road bike is it uh i just had um i i started working at a bike shop so i started working at a bike shop actually before i was allowed to work uh and i was just like because i'm a russian immigrant so before i had a work visa okay. and awesome boss he would just let me like wrench on bikes and i would trade for like parts um so i was able to build up uh just like a steel steel bike um yeah kind of just a city cruiser yeah uh, like single speed and then later i made it into like a one by five uh okay. just like down tube shifters kind of nerdy like steel fenders that's what I started on, man. I started on a cheeky road bike with down tube shifters. I didn't even know what STI shifters were. I saw that and I was, my mind was blown. I was like, whoa, this is yeah, insane absolutely. rocket ship bike. So then you get, you leave high school and someone's like, hey, you should come race these bikes with us or something. Or how, how did you find this? Oh, I would just, uh, well, part of it was we had a pretty big messenger scene here in Minneapolis. Um, and that, that was really like this really cool thing that I saw, you know, I think at one point I was on the bus, you know, I'm just a teenager. I'm I'm on the bus, maybe even with my mom, um, on the city bus downtown. And then all of a sudden I see like all these bike messengers, like racing through traffic. Uh, and this is like middle of the winter. And I'm like, what is happening? It's so cool. Um, uh, and you know, I, I saw a little bit about that culture online. Uh, this is before like big social media. So I don't know where I saw it, like maybe on YouTube or something. Um, and it turns out that's the the biggest like Minnesota winter alley cat at the time. It was called Stuper Bowl. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was yeah huge alley cat. I mean, people would travel here from internationally from Europe. Um, just different messengers from around the world would travel here to do this huge. That's huge wild. Cat race. Um, so that was part of it. Another part of it was I had a French teacher in high school and she showed us the Tour de France mm. right? just part of French class. Right. It's just it's a part of their culture. And I saw it, you know, and I was commuting to to the high school. Uh, it was a small high school without school buses. So that was like kind of had to either that or like get a ride. Um, and yeah, I was I was just captivated. That's it was such a beautiful sport. Mm hmm. And I was like, okay, like I bike, you know, this is cool. Like, how do I get into it? I had no idea. So I just Googled around and I found that we have a track. We had a track here in, in uh, north of the cities, north of Minneapolis. It's called the Blaine uh, National Sports Center. An incredible wood strip, 250, 250 meter track. Um, yeah, so I just happened to live next to like, possibly the best riding track in North America. You know, it's, it's not Carson. It's not like Carson where it's covered. Okay. Door wood strip track, but the way it was designed, it was like designed by these German engineers and it just rode so well. Anyone, anyone who's ridden that track will tell you it's one of the best tracks I've ever ridden. Um, it was just smooth. The transitions were like, you know, you can 
if you're up on the blue line, like up high in the track and you're skilled enough, you could just ride without hands, right? Because mm. it's the transitions were just so smooth. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I, I always like get a little excited when people bring up the track because there's a track. I go down to Florida in the winter and there's one there and people are going to die like uh, Brian Piccolo. And I guess it's a known track down there. A lot of people go and they, I don't know, apparently there's a bike my size there. And um, you mentioned Carson and someone is like, dude, you need to figure out how to ride a track bike so you can come to Masters Nats in California. I'm like, ah. I mean, maybe, I don't know. So everybody who talks about track racing loves it. So I feel like I should at least try it at some point, but so yeah. then you get on the road. Yeah. And then you just like, yeah. So it was, it was track, um, worked up my way through categories and then cyclocross became like a big thing in like mm. early 20 teens, you know, Jeremy powers. And I was like watching his vlogs and it was the barriers. And barriers, yeah. And it was getting really big here in the Midwest. You know, we had uh, Jingle Cross and Trek Cup. Uh, so I got into that locally here um, and raced that until I was a Cat 1. Um, you know, nothing amazing. I, I won like a few local races as a Cat Cat 1-2. Uh, we had some really fast guys here locally. So it was mostly like, like when the best guys weren't there, I, would, I was mm. able to win here or there. I went to nationals um, in like, what was it, 2014 or something, 15, and just got smoked, you know. Um, it was a huge mass start uh, cross nationals in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, that's back when they just allowed everybody to start. So, like, it'd be like Jeremy Powers at the front, and it would be like me and everybody else, like, you know, 150 people on the same course at one time <laughs> so crazy yeah yeah, yeah. And, and so then then you, okay. then, then you hit the road so this is so so surprising to me because i in like just looking back at your results and stuff you also have like a you got six at uh tt nats and you've done really well on the road as a time trial so i'm like oh maybe that's where some like this gravel power comes from Zoot dude clearly has some raw wattage um, but you were really like alley cat and, and cross racing before all of this even kind of began. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, during this time, I'm like doing a lot of messenger races too. And just working a little bit here and there doing like food delivery. And, uh, yeah. And then I, I got burnt out after that, that mm -hmm. nationals. I was like, man, I trained so hard and I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I, like pounded myself into the wall and, uh, yeah, just uh, quit racing for a little bit, a few months, and I got a motorcycle and had this romantic idea of just driving it across the country. Mm. And ended up driving like all the, the West states from like Minneapolis to Seattle, then down down the coast, down the one. Um, and then when I was in California, I was visiting a friend, and she was friends with Jordan Ataya of Semper Poro. Mm. Do you know that story? Uh, I don't know the story, but is he the one on like, is he the guy that started it? I can't put the name. I've seen, watched some of his like YouTube stuff. And when Corey Lockwood was involved with them, they seem to like put out more content. And so uh, all I know is he has like a unique training philosophy. If I remember correctly that I don't know what it was, but people were always like, Oh, this dude's like doing some wild stuff. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was kind of a cult. <laughs> yeah. It, that, it, I was like dipping my toe. And I'm like, do I want to watch these? Like, who, the, yeah, you had to like drink, the, drink this. And then, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah I mean, we, we can, I mean, that's a can of worms, but um, <laughs> I, yeah, like he, he kind of gave me this idea that like, Hey, if you want to go, like, if you want to be a pro, I'll make you a pro, but you got to like move down here to SoCal and um, train your butt off. Um mm. So that's what I did. I was like, cool. Okay. Um, I'm like 23, 24, I think. And, um, this guy is telling me I can go to the tour de France. I'm like, heck yeah, let's, let's go. Um, so yeah, moved down there, moved to SoCal and, um, started doing road like full time. Uh, yeah. And yeah, he, Jordan had, uh, some pretty unusual ideas and some of them were actually really smart and, and worked. And some of them were, you know, kind of kooky and maybe a distraction or 
What are some know. of those things that worked? What are some of the weird stuff you like, man, I can't believe we were doing that back then. Yeah. Uh, so we were really diving into carb loading. Mm. Yeah. But it was, it was interesting. It was carb loading. It wasn't, we, we didn't talk at all about eating on the bike. Um, but we were hitting the carb loading super hard. Uh, and I think that helped me in training and racing a lot. I think back then, especially people weren't really focused on that. You know, we're just emerging from like the, you know, you know, keto, like, or like, you know, em emaciated era. <laughs> what year was it? So wait, when was this 2010? No, it's a little later. This is like, 15 2015 15. I, was, I mean i think that's still the like 60 grams of carbs an hour recommendation and then they're like oh wait actually it's 90 oh wait it's a hundred oh wait it might be 120 like we carbs yeah. and cycling is just like lagging big time and yeah yeah well so let me ask so when you say you weren't doing it on the bike was was that just that you guys didn't think about talking about on the bike or was he like don't worry about on the bike just do it beforehand I think it was just a different mindset. You know, we, we were talking about um, just loading up on carbs, you know, how much are you going to burn during the race? Right. It's kind of, kind of like what we do right now. Like if, when I go to a gravel race, I'll look at how long it is. I'll estimate how many KJs I'll burn. And um, well, and really I'm just estimating how many hours it is. So then I can do like my max amount of carbs that my gut can take. It actually doesn't matter how many KJs I burn. Yeah. What what's the what's the number your max that you shoot? Uh, for? I'm pretty comfortable. I have a pretty good gut. Like I'm pretty comfortable with the 120. Mm. Uh, and then sometimes a little more. And if I go overboard, I'll have some tums or something that I bring with me. Oh wow, you carry that in a race. Do you bring that on training too or is that just a race day thing? A uh, race day thing, yeah. Hot tip, pro tip. Uh yeah, tums or like uh what are they called? Rollades? Yeah, roll, okay. roll. It's like a nice package because it's just like a little little roll, and there's not too much trash. You know, you know, tums are like a big bottle, so you right. just get a little tums thing. Um, and that too, that can settle your stomach pretty quick if you're overdoing it on the carbs. And with gravel, there's so much time that you know maybe you have half an hour, forty five minutes, maybe an hour without eating too much. But mm -hmm. if you get back on it after that, mm. you're probably fine. Um, well, yeah, I've never so, heard that. That's cool. <clears throat> yeah, it's. Uh, I can't remember. That's definitely passed down knowledge to me from from maybe Nick Gould, my teammate. I'm not not really sure from who. Uh, another thing is um, uh, a product called Rocket Lights, uh, Carbo Rocket. Car it's just a, yeah, awesome little product. It's just a, a electrolyte pill. Uh, like a capsule, but it's got ginger in it and it's got peppermint in it. And oh, ginger wow. and peppermint settle your stomach and you got some electrolytes in there. So when you know it's hot, you're like cramping, bonking. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that stuff has been like a lifesaver in the race. So any carbo rock, it's carbo rocket, you said or what was it called? Yep, carbo rocket. Yeah, cool. they were a sponsor of ours, uh, like three years ago two years ago now um but i'm, I'm still using them they're awesome yeah. dude they, you should they should be your sponsor you should we should be plugging this yeah yeah, See, yeah. my friends always laugh, like yo dude what's the code i'm like i got you don't yeah. really use the code and, and cool cut cool small company american company yeah they're awesome Look them up. sweet shout out to brad shout out let's go so then, okay, so, and not to, not in a disparaging way, but really curious, what are some of the things maybe you guys were doing that were like, eh, that was a waste of time. That was a distraction. Um, hmm. And I don't think it's a knock. It's like yeah, it's yeah. even basic training stuff. It's like, I'm like, oh, shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. I, I mean, I think the big takeaway for me is a goal setting. Mm. Um. You know, I think it's really important for young athletes and for all athletes to set realistic goals, intermittent goals, right? Uh, goals that are uh, follow one another in in like intensity or in, um, you know, levels, right? So, yes, you might want to make it into the world tour. You might want to be a national champ, a world champ, um, 
and that might be your goal, then that's all right. That's cool. Um, I don't think it's crazy to have a goal like that. And that's that's kind of the, the type of goals we set on Semper Poro. Um, but you have to have goals along the way. You just mm. have to because mm. if you gotta like get in a pattern of meeting your setting a goal, meeting a goal, achieving a goal, and going on to the next one. If you just have only the big goals, you're just always not meeting a goal, mm -hmm. right? And then every time you do a race, every anything, anytime you achieve anything, you're like, yeah, but, you know, that kind of attitude. Yeah, but I'm still not a world champ. Yeah, but I'm mm -hmm. not uh, on the world tour or whatever. Like, you just see how far you are from your goal. I love that, man, because I think I was talking to a friend about goals and I said, man, do you remember back in like 2010, you know, we would be like, okay, if one of us on the team can be New York state road champ, that will be freaking wild. And what about this? And then like, what about like maybe bat and kill, maybe somebody can get on the podium. And so like, we'd all have individual ones. But it was kind of like some of ours overlapped. And if you hit one of those goals, it was like, oh, yes, this is awesome. And then you still had, as you're saying, like the smaller goals of regional races and whatever, and like to to kind of like stair step you up there. And sometimes today, I, I'm in like forums and I read about what people are shooting for. And it's like, okay, I, I only want a top 20 big sugar. I want this thing and I want this thing. And if they don't get it, they think the season's a failure. And I'm like sitting here reading like just people's reactions. I'm like, there's... a and I feel like the old guy right now in the room being like back in my day, but it seems like people are, if I don't hit all three of my quote unquote, a goals that the internet has said, we have to set for cycling seasons then now I failed. And it's just like a very, that you're probably not going to do that. Cause if you're setting the right goals, like, Hey, I want to be world champ. One of those should be very, very, very almost impossible to get to. And if you're like, get it, it's going to shock your face. But it's just like, it's surprising to me where goals come from now. And yeah, that just really resonates a lot with me. I, I appreciate you saying that because it, I try to think myself and like, okay, what is my really reach goal next year? What would really surprise me? And then what's what's the goal that I'm going to hit? Like I need those stair steps. And then do you go as micro as like, goals within the week like workout wise or do you more stay towards events like well, how do you break that down on like the lower level of achievable ones uh i think i'm i'm a heavy camper when the goals are either like process goals or just i mean just like feeling good right like i i don't i feel like i'm i race better when i don't have race goals at all um Go or on. Or it might be Find something a process goal for people that don't. And so I'm clear. What do you mean when you say process goal? Uh, I mean, it might just be like, you know, not don't over or like train in a way where you can consistently train mm -hmm. and like not overdo it mm -hmm. where you like then have to back off for a lot. Right. Or mm -hmm. like injure yourself. Mm -hmm. um, or it could just be like, all right, just like log your food. If you're doing that thing mm -hmm. or you know, count your calories diligently if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, Do you count or, calories? Uh, I've done it on and off. Yeah, uh, I don't right now. Yeah, neither do I. I did, I'm very, I'm just hypersensitive to it because I just stopped. I said I would do a three month in my head thing and it just ended. And I'm like, thank God that's over. I learned, I relearned a lot. I think it's a very educational thing. But it, for yeah. me, I end up eating to the app, no matter how hard I try and disassociate and just log. I'm like, oh, I need 732 calories, but I'm not really hungry. And it, yeah, it just messes with me. I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. No, that, that's, I like that. The process goals. And I think you've mentioned overtrain a few times. Do you feel like you overtrain or is that your natural tendency? Do you just love training so much? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Did not uh, expect that answer. <laughs> that's that's snuck in there. Okay. Wait, so no, I'm not the kind of person that like loves to just train all the time and train super hard. I love riding my bike. Okay. Well, that's training. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, I can't say that I'm like the type of person that I, I love I love like achieving like a certain number in training or like mm. man, like get to like 30, 30, a 30 hour week. Right. So work up to a 30 hour week. Like, wow, that feels super badass. Yeah. Um, something like that, or like a certain power number or part of weight or something like that. Um, mm. 
So that that feel that's I get a lot of satisfaction from something like that. Um, or just knocking a workout out, like right, like getting a green day and just. Um, well, that is that like feeling that when you said like, oh, I hit this thirty hour week, that feels badass. That's so internally motivated. And I think the people that unravel are there just for the palmares and the wins and the victories and the kudos and the, you know, kind of maybe doing it for external reasons. And that's usually a short lived cycling career or any endurance sport career. And when you say, oh, well, I don't, I don't die, I don't love to, to train a lot, but I do love riding my bike. It's like, what? That is training. I mean, I think. I love riding and I learned a really good lesson this year of kind of what you said before. I was thinking, man, what do I, am I riding too much? Am I racing too much? And I've been married for a few years and that definitely shifted some motivations. And it's like, okay, what is really important to me? Why am I doing this? And so I was not going to race, started riding a lot. And my thing of overtraining was when I realized I didn't want to go hard or I would try and go hard. And I had like one effort and I was like, dude, I'm effed. How am I riding so much? But like, I have no depth whatsoever. Well, I'm going to get this KOM, but then that's it. And then I was like, well, why am I doing all this riding if I'm not actually fast now? Like I'm slow. And yeah, it's, it's just the, no, I was trying to do it by myself too. And I, I struggle with self-coaching. So it was like just too many miles. Do you work yeah. with a coach or you do your own thing? I, I've worked with coaches, uh, you know, over my career but right now i'm just self-coached yeah in the last like gravel season you did it on your own uh no i worked with uh source endurance oh yeah. cool uh, were you with adam uh yeah i was with adam mills Sweet. yeah shout out to adam if you guys didn't listen to that uh, podcast he was on that was a good one do you know taylor from source i do yeah yeah we raced road together for a while oh no way we're doing, we're doing one tomorrow uh oh. tomorrow morning yeah so yeah. I've never met him before, but we were just like chopping it up. And I was like, dude, these are cool topics. Let's and he brought, he's like, do you want to do a podcast? I'm like, let's go. I love doing a podcast. Yeah. I'd love to hear that for sure. Yeah. But yeah, kind of what you're saying, like, I think it's important to kind of tr do the cycling thing from like, you, you got to keep the joy. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's where overtraining comes in. And for me, like when I'm overtrained, I don't, I don't get joy from riding anymore. Um, and usually if I, if I listen to that feeling, if I listen to that intuition, then I'm fine because then I'm like, okay, I'm not enjoy. Like I'm so like overtrained and for a while now that I don't, I'm not enjoying the bike anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's been like this for a bit. So that probably means like, I want to enjoy the bike. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do what it takes to enjoy the bike again. Mm -hmm. Usually that means backing off. Do you feel any that there's any like red flags before you get to that point that are maybe like, yo, you're doing this a little bit too much? Or is it more you hit the wall and you're like, oof, I went there? I mean, I I would say that that intuition or that like joy feeling is actually is actually the thing that uh if you listen to it, it'll prevent you from hitting the wall, right? Got it. Like the wall is farther. You can, mm -hmm. you can like keep going. You can stay in that misery for a while. And some yeah. people like just stay in that for, you know, a year or whatever, or longer and just keep, keep digging the hole. I think that's why you need races and like litmus tests outside of just the training. Like even if it's a group ride, so you can say like, wait, I used to beat X, Y, and Z and now I cannot even keep up with them, but I'm doing my, you know, this favorite workout that I've got. And I'm just going to do another one because more is better. And yeah. Yeah, I think taking a step back, it's, uh, you know, I think COVID too changed things for people. That was a weird year of training. Some people got to train more because they didn't work. Some people trained less because they weren't racing and racing was their thing. Or And that's when you made the shift to gravel, right? Would you ever go back to road or what's, give us like, you know, you're doing road, did really well. Then you changed up to gravel. That was after COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of during, yeah, right after COVID or during COVID, I suppose. Um, yeah, road. I mean, I'm already 32 and, uh, I think it's kind of hard to like get into, you know, get back into that world. Maybe not pro, but even just like, do you enjoy it so much that you don't have to do it for money, but that you're like, I love road racing or is that not a thing for you? Uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's time. It's a commitment of time and travel and all that stuff. And uh, yeah. Said I, differently, I, there's the Minnesota state road cat one championship. You're feeling fit. It's June and it's 15 minutes from your house. Are you going? You know, probably not. Damn. Unfortunately, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of dead here for racing. Okay. Uh, and maybe it's like people like me saying this right now, like <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like I, I think if I'm, you know, I like to feel good if I'm racing, like I want to feel really good. So if I'm in good shape, then I would love to like, uh, like, like two years ago I was doing gravel full time, but I also did Redlands and I did Joe Martin as a cat one, two. I saw you. Yeah, you did really well there. Well, yeah. Okay, so yeah, sorry. I was assuming that say you were fit and ready to rip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You maybe go then. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you just you know you just you get to enjoy your body. You get to enjoy yeah. feeling good and like ripping it up and. Yeah. What what's um training wise? What do you think has changed for you from like your elevate days to the gravel days? You doing anything different, or is it a lot of the same stuff? Or it's good on. Uh, yeah, it's. I think it's it's pretty different. Um, I think for gravel, you know, it's a, especially as a gravel pro, it's, it's nice to race a lot. It's fun to race a lot, you know, especially if you're, and there's a financial aspect, you know, if your team, uh, gives you a bonus or whatever, start money, or you have a potential of winning money, uh, then you end up racing more. Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes a lot out of you too. So for gravel racing, especially if you're racing a lot, I mean, it's not a lot of training you're training using the races and then maybe you know squeezing in a, a workout or yeah probably one workout a week um what's that one workout that you would go to now that there's just one but what are some things what do you feel like you need to supplement your gravel racing with uh i like to keep it super i love when training is just stupid easy like mm -hmm. dumb stupid easy monotonous uh i'm that kind of uh athlete and what i was doing that i was really enjoying is like early season i would just do a ton of zone two right if it's like january february so if i have a a day where i can do a big day i'm just doing zone two a little later like you know february march april ish uh i'm doing tempo and I'm just going to do tempo <laughs> like tempo. Just like as long until you blow or blocks. Yeah like, or? yeah. like blocks blocks. Yeah. Um, and then maybe a little, yeah, you know, maybe playing with cadence a little bit, a little bit of slow cadence, a little bit of high cadence. Um, I love low cadence. Yeah. Low cadence. Yeah. That's one of the things that Semper Poro did that I think was pretty smart, pretty good for, at least for my body type. Uh, was someone did what type, sorry, I mean to cut you off. What type of duration are you doing on a low cadence day? I know you're like just kind of flowing with it, but do you have like, hey, I want to get in 20 minutes, an hour, blah, blah, blah? Uh, like 20. Yeah. Okay. That feels productive or yeah. maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at its peak with Semperpora, we were doing, we were, I was climbing Palomar, Mount Palomar, the whole thing in low cadence. Sweet. So that was like yeah. over, over an hour. That's wild. I mean, um, I think Mikhail Kwiatkowski is the, I probably butcher his last name, is the guy that I was reading about that does that, like 30-minute climbs over and over and over again on six-hour rides, just loads of low cadence. That worries me a little bit from an injury aspect, but yeah, like an hour, like building up to that, like starting in 20 minutes, getting up to an hour. I think it's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, I, you know, the injury thing, I mean, I think if, unless you're like just going right at it without any preparation um i don't yeah. think there's a ton of injury risk with low cadence i mean if you think about it it's not like you know you're not like squatting a hundred pounds for an hour true you're it's probably the equivalent of lifting i don't know like 20 pounds or maybe low i don't know what that's it is. low it's the yeah it's not no like weight. You know, cycling already is pretty low like low low stress i guess low injury um, so as long as you're, I feel like as long as your core is good and your position and your back, right. 
if you're going to throw out your back or you like something weird's going on with your knees where they're not tracking right. That's what worries me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, then you're a hundred percent right. Only because of people, you know, I think if you get fatigued and you're determined athlete, and you're like, I got to get this last 20 minutes. And you're like, Ooh, that feels kind of funny. I'm just going to push through and you have the endorphins going. Then you get home and later it's like, Oh shit, I shouldn't have done that last. Yeah. No, I agree with you. It's not like, gonna, you're not squatting 300 pounds, but yeah, that after a deadlift session, or I've been getting back in the leg press recently, which some people say cool, some will say it's stupid, but yeah, just you're so connected to the pedals and just crushing. Um, I don't know, I'm a season long lifter. You, I, I think I was listening after I met Ben Delaney, you were on his podcast, you were talking about velocity. Is that the thing where, or elite? Uh, yes. lifting that's something like with velocity and you put it on the barbell or can, can you go into am i right on that yeah yeah yeah. uh so there's a software called elite form um and they mostly it's a software and hardware company yeah. um it's it's uh the ceo is uh cyclist super awesome guy skip um and they're out of uh lincoln i believe yeah i think you're right Link in Nebraska. And um, so anyway, the comp the the company's main product is like this big camera that you put on a squat rack and they uh and the software for it. Um and they they market it and sell it to big colleges, NFL programs, um, you know, sock any any big team sport that that has that big budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like a lot of the collegiate programs in the U.S. use this for uh, football, basketball, those kind of sports. Um, and then they also have a, a product that's just an app, right? And I think it's it's still free. Um, yeah, it's just Elite Form, and you you have to have the iPhone because it has this the right camera for it for the velocity tracking lidar camera, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all that does, so it just captures your movement. Um, you enter the weight that you're lifting, right? So you you say, I'm doing a squat, I'm doing a back squat. I got, you know, the bar plus the weight, 120 pounds. Um, you hit start, and then it just captures your movement, and it gives you a wattage uh, power in watts, and it gives you a velocity in meters per second um and then using that information you can kind of track so you can track how how well you're lifting beyond just the weight because maybe you're going up in weight but that doesn't necessarily mean you're like getting more explosive it might not mean uh you're even getting necessarily stronger um Mm. you know like maybe you're just putting on more weight but i don't know it's just it's more metrics and it's really helpful yeah. especially when you're not lifting your max right if you're just doing like 100 pounds cool i can target a certain velocity for um and there's a bunch of uh new like data coming out about this uh using uh velocity based training i think that's what it's called v like vbt um and you can use certain velocities to target certain types of adaptations okay that's what um, I was going to ask, because I don't know the answer to this, like, you know, and <laughs> whew, also I'm like super uneducated right now. Uh, but, you know, I lift because it quote unquote makes me stronger. I lift because I feel like way more solid and I'm like, well, I'm like getting like cut up and lean and I feel it on the bike, but I've always, I have never found a ton of benefit and maybe it's because I'm more naturally anaerobic of like doing a lot of plyo or transferring over into more like explosive movements. And I'm like, well, I think I'm just going to stay with like basic strength stuff. Um, which I'd just be curious of like learning more about the different adaptations from different speeds and different things for different types of athletes, because some people, that I coach they're like, I kind of, I like this explosive. So I'm like, great, let's do it. Like if it feels good to you and especially for people that are bad at like going really hard and just have that, they don't have that like, ah, and can't like freak out on the bike. Like you kind of need, if you can figure out how to do that in the gym, then you can learn how to go ape on the bike and you'll be faster. 
Um, that's obviously very not scientific, but if there was numbers behind that and a way for them to better understand that, I think that'd be really cool. I'll have to look into that. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I could be wrong. I don't, I don't think plyo, like the data behind plyo and cycling, I don't think plyo is like, there's a ton of That's benefits. Diff- okay. So, you know? Um, yeah. I never found any benefit. I've had different coaches over the years and some were into programs like that, where it's like, you know, list out different phases and they'd go and apply. I'm like, I feel like I'm lo- I'm not getting stronger. And I feel like I don't need to be doing box jumps. I'm like, this isn't making my explosive whether sprint or one minute effort any better. So I think I'm just going to like lift more. I don't know. And, and I get it. Like there's not, you ask 10 different people about weights and cycling or weights and other endurance sports, you get 10 different answers, which is kind of why I always like the topic is just everybody has their own special way of doing it. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting Now, as long as people are lifting that's why I think there's benefits. Like, are you, get, can you, well, I was gonna say, are you getting stronger? And like, do you feel it on the bike? Yes. Great. No, then let's do something different. And that might be too. For sure. Or even easy. off the bike. Like, do you feel better in general? Like, yeah. is your posture better? Do you have less back pain when you're just standing around? Like things like that. I noticed when I first started doing deadlifts, I, you know, I w- walk into the gym and I'm, I would have been squatting for a couple of years before. I'm like, wow, this is really weird. How do I do this? I'm going to watch these YouTube videos in the gym. I'm like, eh, do it wrong for a few months, talk some, blah, blah, blah. So the progression, right. Of like figuring out how to deadlift. And then as I got more into it, I remember I went and I was helping somebody move stuff and I went to pick up a box and I was thinking, oh, whoa, da- like I squat down differently and I hip hinge differently and I don't bend with my back and I can lift it well this is really crazy and then just the more glute strength and hammies and then i got into the trap bar and so like the journey from i think cat five lifter to i'm i don't know maybe a cat three and a half cat three uh that's probably as far as i'll go but like is so cool you just and there's just so much more to just year after year i feel better and stronger more like whole i don't know it's like i don't know what the description is just like i feel more solid and I, I don't get that. bulky. Like, I, you know, people are always like, I don't want to get bulky. And so I said, go tell the guy in the gym that's trying to get jacked that you're going to get bulky from lifting two to three times a week. And he's going to laugh at you so hard. Yeah. 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 There's people who are like in there all day, every day trying to get bulky and they're getting like, I don't know, a pound a year. Yeah. Muscle mass. Yeah. 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 I love. Yeah. Said so people like, dude, I can't, I can't get near a bench. I can just get too jacked. I'm like, oof. Yeah. Be a little bit more modest, my friend. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna be okay. So just yeah. do a push. That's all right. Oh man, what's the um? Do you have any like specific like mental routine that you go through that when things are kind of tough or that when you've maybe feel you're getting towards that man, I'm overtrained a little bit or even like different scenarios, like you're getting ready for a big race and you got to like, you feel like, all right, now, now's the time to get focused. Like, how do you talk yourself through hard workouts, hard blocks, maybe the 30 hour weeks? Like, is there anything, or do you just like, re- you seem like very uh, relaxed person. Maybe you don't overthink it and you just kind of roll with things. Like, how do you, there's a lot in that question, but does anything resonate there with you? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, people say I'm, I seem really chill, but like internally, I think I have a lot of like, you know, like a a constant internal monologue and, you know, just typical human stuff. I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I think, uh, one thing that's been really helping is I've been doing a morning meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I've skipped a day or two, but for a couple of months now, maybe four months, And that's been incredible, you know, just having this constant thing in the morning before, you know, before you're on the phone or before you're just doing stuff or hopefully before you just start thinking about stuff, you know, before that, that the mind just turns on. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I do kind of, uh, I just found it on YouTube, like a guided meditation. That's like really nice, really reassuring, you know, it's like, yeah, it's I was going to ask you what you like, which did you, is this from a book or it's, you just found this guy's video and you thought I'm, Hey, I'm going to start doing this. Or how did that all kind of blossom? Yeah. First, uh, Nick Gould, my teammate, uh, he recommended, uh, something called Kriya, 
which is kind of like a yogic meditation. C R E A. Uh, K R I Y A Kriya. Yeah. It's pretty well, cool. Like it's pretty it's pretty wild and there's some movements, you know. It's like uh yeah, some it's it's pretty cool stuff. And the first time I did it, I was just blown away, you know. It's kind of like if you've ever tried breath work. Yeah. Uh, or even if you do your first yoga class, you're like, wow, that was incredible, right? Like that first time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the first time I did the Korea, I was like, what? man, that was incredible. Um, and for a while, after a while, I was like, okay, I just want to be still. I don't want to like move my arms and breathe. And I just want to be still, um, mm -hmm. to be more chill, to bring in that like relaxed energy in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I just found a YouTube video that I liked. Um, That's cool. I've got, I, uh, somebody recommended this eight minute meditation to me that I've been reading through and it's like week one. It's just kind of talks about like, what is meditation? What is not meditation? Da -da -da. And then it goes through and guides you. And it's very much on a, this is really simple. It's only eight minutes. It will change your life. And I'm very curious to dive into that. And how long do you meditate for? Uh, 15 minutes. Cool. You yeah. Coffee drinker. I used to be, uh, when I started to have the heart palpitations, I stopped drinking any or having any kind of caffeine for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, yeah. so I just do like a hot cocoa in the morning to replace okay. that. <laughs> What's, um, do we finish the thought of what's changed from the elevate days to the gravel days? I think we got sidetracked on something else and I'm yeah. really curious about that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think the demands of road racing are a little different, um, and I think gravel suits me better in general. Um, so I think for, I guess what I was starting to answer is with gravel, I think having a really big base is really important. Right. Um, and then cause the miles are just big, right. You're gonna, you're gonna put your body through a lot. So I think a big base is important. I also think, I mean, this is not something you can build in a year, but just, years of riding really helps gravel and i think that's why we see so many older athletes in gravel um, and maybe why some of the younger riders who are super talented um don't always do great you know after four or five hours uh, mm -hmm. you know on the rivet yes um, but I, lo and I love you pointing out that this might take time I love to tell people when they're three years in and they're like, I've, I'm at my max. I'm like, you are so new. You are, you've ridden your bike like 30,000 miles. That's yeah. not even at that point. If this is their first three seasons, let's say like 15 to 20,000. Like you have so much room to grow. Like just be patient. Are you, you know, got to look down the road, but okay. So the big base in gravel, what do you think is the big difference between road racing and gravel? Because when I first got into gravel, everyone's like, Oh, you got to try this. This new is like, and it wasn't new. I realized to the OG people, people have been doing this for a long time. I'm talking like 2017, 18. And somebody said to me, it's just a lot of like below threshold. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, so how's the race going to start? Like, is this where it's going to like ride long? I'm like, okay, whatever. So I like train for like really long, like sweet spotty stuff, tempo, locations. And then I got into a, a gravel race and it was like a bike race and it was like ape for the first hour and then you were going as ape as you could and i look at the file i'm like wow it's actually a lot of vo2 max and anaerobic capacity so thanks friend <laughs> i mean so what do you besides the distance do you and and obviously there might be the team dynamic like they're definitely different genres for sure so maybe the question is more what do you think overlaps in the two or if you were going to go back and do road and gravel what would you focus on the most I mean, I, I honestly think the training is about the same. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess for uh, for road, I don't think you have to worry quite as I mean, of course, there's so many nuances in road too. like, w you know, which uh, type of racing are you doing? Are you doing like mountain race? You know, are you climbing all day doing crazy stage races um, or doing crits? Right. Mm. Um, I guess the I'm I'm having a hard time answering that really, but I I think what I've noticed is the some of the really incredible road riders, um, they can start a gravel race right, and they're usually the ones at the very front, 
like mm-hmm. the, the pros that come in, they're the ones that are like setting the pace and it's super hard and everyone's like barely hanging on. Um, but then like they just kind of get worn out and they can't do that after like four or five hours, you know, after 3000 KJs. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I usually, I usually, uh, and even, even really strong amateurs who, who get into a gravel race, like a lot of them have no problem being at the front of their race. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the for the first few hours um and it's usually kind of like clockwork right around 2500 kj something happens Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's really interesting i don't really know the answer maybe i'm just overthinking that um but it's to me it seems like pretty much every race around 25 3000 kjs like the group goes from maybe like a you know it could go from 50 to like eight Mm -hmm. you know um and then of course every hour after that it's going to be less and less people that's really interesting that's uh i think really the only big gravel race i've done is gravel worlds and there's one other one um but gravel worlds has been the same very similar to two times i did it and it was wherever the KOM was. I want to say like 50 miles in. So yeah, like probably 2,500 KJs in and the group went from very big to 25. And then soon it was like a dozen people. Um, yeah. I wonder if they're, you know, burning too many matches early, like burning really hot to stay up front. And that's a, the mistake I made in my first gravel race. And then, you know, learning and being more conservative and waiting for that 3000 mark and be like, okay, something's going to pop off soon. Thank God. I haven't been like throwing long bombs early. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't think you're overthinking. I think you're, you're thinking about the right way. Um, and maybe it's just the size of the matchbook, you know, uh, they might not even be doing necessarily anything wrong or anything too different from some of the pros. Right. Uh, they just don't have quite the, you know, as many matches to, to burn. Um, mm. so, course like always all bike racing like conserve conserve your matches yeah what's what's the so uh let's say you get back to health or maybe before this happened i'm always curious on like personal improvement what do you think before all this happened unfortunately what were some of the things you're trying to improve on like all right if i'm gonna get better from here i need to work on this well you know i think last year was a really fun year and a, I think a really successful year for me in gravel. And I was getting a ton of top tens, a couple of top fives. Um, I think I was like fifth in the BWR overall and cool. had some, I don't know, just had some great, great times, great results. Um, and then this year I was coming into this year. I was, I like, I made it into the lifetime grand prix and I'm like, all right, I'm going to step it up a level. Right. And I think that kind of pressure and that like drive that I had was may, I don't know, maybe I didn't quite have the right tools to like, you know, uh, hold that pressure. Right. It's like you, you have the pressure, you have the intensity, you have the drive, but like you have, you need the tools to, um, you know, use that, use that energy without it like exploding. Do you feel uh, in looking back, do you feel like, you know, what tools you were missing or maybe what a misstep was? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, me as, as like a, I guess I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm an older athlete, but I'm definitely getting more mature, getting older. Um, I think bat like life balance is super important. Um, and you know when you're away from home for a long time and things aren't going well in the races and racing is like the only thing you have Mm -hmm. uh that can be really hard mentally and then it's harder to you know it's hard to stay positive it's harder to you know keep killing the workouts it's harder to keep staying lean um so i think as always right having a balance having a focus and harnessing like harnessing the desire that you have to win um, and not letting it kind of, I don't know, get out of control. I don't, I don't think that desire or that like obsession is as necessarily a bad thing. That's how we achieve 
I think that's how we achieve things in life is you like, you have to harness that obsession or that intensity for something you're into. Um, at least for people like us, maybe for, for people who are in like elite sports, um, you know, it's kind of like this, uh, blessing and a curse. Um, and I think we have to learn how to handle that. And I, I think it got out of, out of hand a bit and, um, yeah, I just felt pretty overwhelmed. Um, so I think to answer your question, like going back to the basics, enjoying the sport, um, not really focusing on like, I want to beat, you know, Keegan. <laughs> right. Right. No. And it's, do you, uh, before I forget, there's a good book for people that might want to, it's called passion paradox. And it's, it is just talking about this, like how to harness your passion. So it doesn't wreck everything else in our life. Uh, some really interesting points by Steve Magnus, I believe. And yeah, a lot of good things. Well, do you think that might also be something that you can then turn to those goals that you have set on those different tiers and say, okay, maybe I'm not beating Keegan, but because it's always interesting for me to hear, like, you're a guy that I look at, like, dude, you know, this guy's super fast. He's in the lifetime Grand Prix. You're one of the biggest gravel racers in the country. So to hear you have this, like, hey, I'm kind of drowning right now under all of this stuff and I'm getting... 15th and 20th and I'm not on the podium all the time this is making me not feel great about myself when everyone else is more like dude you're the man you know it's hard and so and I don't say this to make you feel bad about it but to be like you know it's just interesting to hear an athlete at your level go through that because so many people listen to this podcast do this on just a much smaller level right like oh I suck locally and I can't get to that regional thing I'm trying to go to this big race and da 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 so what do you think if you you get healthy, you come back, you get back into a big thing like this, what would maybe be that tool so that you don't feel a negative thing from the pressure? Because there will be pressure. Is it like make the goal, realign the goals or like, how do you think about that now? Yeah, uh, the way I think about it or like the visual, I, 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 the visual that I have for, for this is like, you need your base, right? You need your foundation. And if you try to like take off too quick, mm -hmm. um, and then you're, you don't have like sure footing anymore. So mm -hmm. making sure like everything at home and your relationships is good. Um, everything like financially you're good. And, uh, maybe you're giving back in some way. Like last year I was volunteering at races a lot and that was giving me like, I don't know, it was giving me something, um and f just feeling good that i'm giving back in some way because you know as as athletes it's pretty self-serving a lot of the time in some ways and um yeah so that's so it is all just like find the balance of it all and not be just the race result like, yeah. not and even if you are ready to just like go to the moon but like you gotta i don't know you gotta keep it steady and climb steady i mean none of these pros that we're talking about, like Keegan, you know, he didn't just get there. Right. Mm. He's been building up to that level steadily, patiently. Yeah. Patiently. What a good word. What a good word to try. I mean, this is a conversation that I, I'm always like biting my nails when you've got the athlete who's getting to the point where what's a good analogy. I always kind of think of roadies, but you know, like maybe they're going to start going and I always want to say NRC. Now it's like NLC races, you know, they're going up to the next level where most likely, unless they're a freakish athlete, you know, they're making that, they're crushing locally. They're go do really well regionally. Now they're like, okay, I want to go on the national calendar race as much as possible you're probably going to get 50th you're probably going to get 40th like hopefully if you can get in the top 20 that's a win but they're like i'm winning i'm getting on the podium it's like let's go with that but also be realistic and it's you know what you're saying you go on the road you spend a lot of time your significant other might be like where are you going again and it's a lot of energy and you might not be feeling the results and this just this process that might take a year, two years, four years, if you really want it. And it's tough. It's, um, man, I really appreciate you bringing this up because it is a, I think it kind of knocks people away from endurance sports. Sometimes they're like, I, you know, what? I'm just, I'm not that good. It's like, no, you're just not giving enough time. Like just, just, and yeah. so I'll say, 
can you make the event not just the race? Like maybe you can bring your significant other because there's this dope ass restaurant. She loves Thai food. You know this. You surprise her. Da 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 da. da. Make it fun and go do the race. And maybe that means you race at ninety five percent. But like then all those other bases that you talked about, your finance, your relationship, your job, are really happy. And so you're happy. And it's it is tough, man. That balance. It's um. Keep I going. I, I love I love how you said that. Um. Yeah, like I think 95% for indefinitely is better than like 110% until you just fall off the cliff, right? Totally. So like just keep it keep it 95. Don't and don't don't, don't be your race results. I mean, I think that's something that I never thought I would be this into cycling. Like I got into cycling because I was super overweight and just like drinking my face off. I'm like, oh, this is like a really good outlet. Did not think I'd be doing like cycling podcasts and coaching people. That's for sure. But even in that, it's like, there's times where and not in a positive way of taking a step back. It's like, whoa, like I ride a bike a lot. Should I be doing this? And I think if, as long as you, you, I, as long as I talk through that and like, why am I doing this? What are the other options? Da, 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 and take a pause. It's really helpful. Um, because yeah, like you said, it's it's kind of funny doing a lot of cycling stuff in life. It's like, wait, yeah. what's going on? Yeah, it's kind of a you know, it's kind of a certain like a traveling circus when you're when you're traveling and racing. It's like it's not it's not really you're pretty disconnected from real life. Um, so I think it's important to keep grounded, at least keep like one foot somewhere in reality. Uh, whether it's like through a relationship or just you know, or at least just keep grounded or giving back. I think that's super important. Otherwise you lose your footing. Like you're not grounded anymore. And that's it. Like you fall off a cliff eventually because you get ahead of yourself. I love so. this, the footing idea that is <laughs> resonating so strongly with me. Like have your footing feel like you're stable in the process. And I guess my last comment on it will be with social media. When you talk about the traveling circus, it's easier to get in the circus. I remember um when you well a few years before like when you made the comment hey i went to semper poro and they're like you got to move to la i was a fast cat athlete and i was out in boulder did some training there and frank overton was like i was selling medical devices at the time he's like dude if you want to do this and go to the next level you need to like move out here you need to move to a big city you need to be at every nrc race this year you can't be selling medical devices he's like it's it if you want to go you need to go all in and i wasn't ready to do it and i was like i wait uh no, I'm good. And I remember flying back to Rochester and I was like, should I be doing this? And I talked to my coach, Jason, who worked at Fast Cat. And I was like, I just, I don't know. Like, that's not for me right now. I always wonder what would have happened, like where my life would have gone, but that's like every choice that we make. So having the footing though, like I wouldn't have had the footing to do that. And so this is really insightful. I think not only for younger athletes though but for people that get into the sport later go because what i was saying is now with social media like back then in talking to frank it was so hard to make connection you were like oh i'm gonna email this random email that i got from so-and-so and i'm gonna go go to these races and talk to people now you can see every race on social media you know what every rate you can dm anybody i mean i did a race in ecuador which is like how small is the globe now that i was in like what where did that come from? So like to be on the circus, it's easier to kind of jump in. And I think I encourage people to do it. I mean, I don't know. It's wild, but it's, you know, life is short. It's fun. You said in an Instagram post, don't live a little, live a lot. Yeah. Amen, brother. A lot, live a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Man. Yeah. Social media is another topic. I don't know how much time you have, but hit it, hit it. Cause this is probably a good one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, I think it's a, kind of a blessing and a curse for cycling and for athletes, uh, for young athletes, for all athletes, you know, um, I, I think overall, like it does give us, you know, the ability to race and to be professional for at least for some, in some amount. Um, but I think you have to be really careful with it, you know, mm -hmm. I think because, uh, and maybe I'm projecting, but like, I feel like a lot of elite athletes are kind of obsessive right they're they're and it's again that's not necessarily a terrible thing um i think you can harness that for good but you know it's like if you have a a bunch of candy in your pocket 
with you all the time. Like I'm the kind of person that's going to keep eating it. Mm -hmm. Same with Instagram or whatever. Like if I have my phone in my pocket and I can just scroll anytime, all the time, I'm going to be scrolling. Mm -hmm. And I, dude, that is not good. No. That's not and I've been taking a big break from Instagram. And when you take a break, you realize how much you're, I guess, missing of just like living and like looking at stuff, just mm -hmm. being with yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. you're standing in line somewhere and you're just like, cool, I'm just here. I'm just in line looking around. Maybe I can talk to somebody like maybe I can just think, think about something or just you know, meditate or whatever, like meditate on something. Um, or if you're riding, like, I think I highly recommend people to at least sometime ride without any, anything in your ears to just do a five hour ride completely silent. I think I don't it's... know how people ride with stuff in their ears. I'm, I, I realize I'm the oddball. Um, I never ride with something in my ears. Like I love the sound of the road and, I, I figured who I was listening to they're like you know there's only so much nature I can take <laughs> I laugh because I'm like I look forward to that and I feel very blessed that I have a job where I can put my phone on silent on do not disturb and for the five hours can't reach me um and there's just that time that uh even like I try and reach Landry sometimes one of our other coaches and he's like oh sorry man I have my phone off and I'm like you should turn it off he's like oh yeah I don't, I can't, I don't want that distraction. I'm like, I love that dude. It's like, it's social media. I'm a big fan of it, but it's, I have to, you know, I put the timer on my phone. Um, I use the Apple one, but there's another one that someone said is better. It's like called not Opus, but um, even seeing someone said, Hey, you've had 15 minutes and me having to make the conscious thought of, I need to keep doing this. Or it's like, Ooh, damn, that was 15 minutes. Okay. Get out of here. Like go away. So yeah, social media, it's, um, I, I think also my last comment on it, cause I don't want to sound poop on it. Just, I looked back at my first picture ever. I was at a BMs. No, was it BM? No, it was a Scott bike demo day. And I'm sitting in a chair and I'm like, look, I'm drinking a Mountain Dew. And I'm like, hanging out with these bikes. Cool. And now myself included, it's like, eh, you know, I've either got a post that I'm plugging something a post that I've probably put too much thought into. I try to sometimes think, what would I post if I knew just my mom was looking? What's my like catch up picture? And, you know, so even how I, I don't want to project to other people, but how I look at my own social media posting has changed so much over whatever it is, 10 years that Instagram has been out. So it's interesting. I'm kind of ready for the next thing, not TikTok, but like a different vibe of it that's maybe a little bit more organic that will probably change over time also but I yeah i can gonna... appreciate that trying to be careful with social media it's a powerful thing yeah i was just gonna say i think you're doing it right now like i think the next thing is like slow stuff i think it's 90 minute podcasts and i think it's 30 minute youtube videos i think so uh, yeah are we, I ahead, think... are we at the head of the time right now you know well, that's what I want. That's what I look for. You know, like I, I want to watch a long YouTube video and like really learn about something and okay, get into the depth. Right. I'm so sick of like the, the short stuff, the shallow stuff. Yeah. Um, it's not gratifying to me anymore. And I understand, I see it as like, okay, it's just a candy. It's just a little dopamine. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, maybe that's, that's the next thing. Dude, so let me, I'm going to riff on this and you'll laugh, but the, uh, Landry, we're talking about the podcast and, you know, we're super small. We've got 5,000 people on YouTube, maybe 2,000, I think we just hit 2,000 Instagram. So we're not like a Dylan Johnson or anything like that, but I think we've had some pretty amazing guests and I get a little like nervous about what I'm going to ask them and I might not know them that well. I only know you from doing some research and I don't want this to be a waste of your time. And so in doing it, I kind of I read this book tribe of mentors that Tim Ferriss put out that it's like eight to 10 questions that he asked over and over again. I was like, well, this is really interesting hearing the same questions with different responses. And I kind of got in that flow and Landry the other day was like, Oh, are you going to like make the podcast better in 2024? I'm like, dude, wait, what? He's like, I don't know. It's just, you asked the same question. So I've like heard this, I'm like, but the answers are different. He's like, yeah, but it's just sometimes. And then Tom jumped in and was like, 
you clearly like to talk to people or you wouldn't be doing this podcast and you kind of go start going down a thing and I'm like, Ooh, where's he going? And then you shift and I can tell you shift because you have these questions. So I did a podcast with Riley Pickrell. He's on um, Israel premier tech. And he was the first person I was like, okay, I'm going to not ask all these questions. I'm just going to like talk to this dude. And I got kind of nervous and I was like, ah, so you're the first person where I really, and I was humbled when you're like, oh, I've heard your podcast before. I was like, oh shoot, he's heard the podcast. So you maybe have heard more of that. Like it's, it's not, I don't try to make it a script, but I try and hit training topics. Cause I think that's what people want to hear. And in social media, people are like, you gotta do this and you gotta do this. And your show needs to be this. I'm like, I don't know what I want. What is, what is our show? I just, I'm just a dude who likes cycling. I just want to talk to this guy. So you were the first person. I was like, okay, after the questions, some of them will naturally come up, but I'm just curious about this dude who's been riding since he's 19 and let's just see what happens. And I think he's a good person. Some people are bad at talking. And so like, I kind of have to feed questions where someone's like, dude, just have a conversation with him. That's what I want. I was like, okay, I'm going to try it with Eno. Wish me luck. So I'm not going to lie. I had the questions behind the questions of yours where I like take notes. I was like, just in case I freak out. But no, man, it's social media. It, even things that I want to create and talk about, I like double think, am I doing the right thing for what people want to watch? And, and then it's like, why do I care about that? So yeah, you, it, strikes home big time so i appreciate you man <laughs> dude i think i think this was a great conversation this was one of my favorites because it was so organic i was like this is badass my uh do you have any closing uh, one thing i can't look at my phone because i'm filming on it um it's not baluto and you might know the place it's downtown by the football stadium it's a small pizza place and if you haven't been it begins Baruto, Baluto. There's a place called Baluto. Yeah. I feel it's like it's a- that. They make these oval pizzas. Is yeah. that a local? I stumbled across. I was there for a meeting two years ago and I was like, this place is freaking insane. Is that like a local fave place? Or where do you do you it's eat? Like pizza? A, it's like a chain now. Yeah. Oh, really? Then maybe yeah. God, I feel but I think it started up, I think it started as a small place and I think it just blew up. Yeah. That makes me sad. It's like a uh, South America. It's like Argentinian pizza or something. Yes. Is that right? It was a weird, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, would you know what's the, when you said Minneapolis, I'm like, why do I, oh, that restaurant. Cause I always talk about it. Like it was so randomly one of those places we just were like, oh, they have pizza. Let's grab a slice. And like, no, we don't really do slices. We make these pizzas. And it was Argentinian. I'm like, wait, what, what am I getting? It was amazing. So if you hadn't been there, but now that it's a chain, I'm like, eh, it kind of lost its I deliver it all the time, but I've never had it. <laughs> so <laughs> sneak a sneak a bite, sneak a bite. You have uh, any close any closing thoughts for the people? I man, I really just the vibe that you put out. People um will post your Instagram and stuff. And I know that you Eno gravels your YouTube, but you haven't posted videos. You should let's get you oh, going long dude. Forward. Okay, so like last year, I was like, all right, I'm gonna get into videos. And uh I went to film I went to school for film. I was okay. a photography major for two years and cool. had a great time doing that but i think maybe because i was a cinematography major like it's so intimidating for me to get into it um but yeah, i just gotta do it um and because i am so sick of instagram to be honestly um i think youtube would be a, a great way for me to still put out content and be really authentic uh but not um uh, you know participate in in instagram and and kind of the the downfalls of that yeah i mean even get into shorts do like some short film stuff like 90 seconds stuff to get your feet wet like people want to see you and what you're doing on gravel and um yeah i think you know i did it's yeah i won't even get into instagram (laughs) any closing thoughts uh or you know vibes that you want to pass along with people yeah, just, you know, take things one thing at a time. I think that's that's kind of the takeaway from this conversation. And um, yeah, uh, it's a beautiful sport that we're in. And um, it can turn ugly if you're like, you know, if you're a little, if you get ahead of yourself, it can it can turn kind of ugly. Um, but uh, yeah, just remember why you like it whenever you're in that in that spot. Find your why. Yes, find your why. Yo, man, thank you so much for doing this. Um, 
this will post probably i almost was gonna say right before the new year but i might make this the one just after the new year because this is the new vibe so yeah but i'll hit you up if you want to repost to people if you're still on instagram cool don't feel like you have to and uh yeah if i can help you out with anything let me know um it was really great to talk i hope we get to ride a bike sometime whether road gravel so do you ride a road bike at all anymore uh, I mean, I ride it on the road a lot. Uh, okay. I've just been riding the Lauf. It's a, yeah. I think a gravel bike is a phenomenal road bike as well. It is. It I I, it is. It misses that top speed, but it's like so. It's like ninety five percent there. Yeah, yeah. I don't tell my gravel bike that's my travel bike, but like I get scared now that I like don't get free bikes and I pay for stuff, and I'm like, I don't want to bring that expensive road bike. I'm gonna bring the gravel bike. Like, let's just throw that in the bike case, and yeah, my gravel bike is okay, but. Yo, have a great day. Thank you so much for doing this. It was a it was a great pleasure. Thank you. Awesome, man. Look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Yeah, likewise. Take care. See ya.